All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming to this session. Um, I want to welcome Dan and Paul from Montpelier Live, and I'm turning it over to them. Thank, thanks for being here. Uh, Dan and I are going to tag team on this. Uh, Dan's the uh, executive director of Montpelier Live. Uh, I am the executive director of the Community Engagement Lab. And so, as we get going, though, just to be sure we're not too settled, I'm going to ask a, a little up and down uh, uh, exercise. Could everybody, I'm going to set you up with a question and stand up if you can answer this question affirmatively. I have traveled to a city and had a specific intention to go see public art while in that location. If you have ever traveled to a location with a specific intention of seeing public art, stand up. Okay, now, sit down if you have ever in Invited, well, hold on, I've got to be sure I'm not getting a double negative here. <laughs> I had this all worked out at one time in my head, and of course. Uh, uh, remain standing, there we go. Remain standing if you have invited somebody to come to your community specifically to see public art. Only remain standing if you have invited somebody to come to your community to see public art. If you have not done that, then sit back down. Awesome. Okay. All right. Okay. About half. Okay. You may all sit. Thank you. We did that exercise here in Montpelier at one of the workshops, and everybody stood up. There were about 20 of us in the workshop. Everybody stood up because everybody had gone to see with an intention to see it. And I said, "Okay, here in Montpelier, how many of you had invited somebody to see public art?" Everybody sat down except for one person. Uh, that was at the beginning of our process about building this master plan. So. I'm going to set up uh, just the, kind of the big arc of what we're going to talk about today. This is all about process. Uh, I don't really care about a plan so much as I care about planning. And one of my favorite quotes is, plans are nothing, planning is everything. So we're going to talk about how we got to the creation of this plan, and hopefully that can give you guys some ideas about how you might jumpstart something like this in your community. This is the only the second uh, public art master plan in Vermont. Uh, Burlington has one that they're in the process of revamping right now, I think. Uh, so this was a new process for Vermont. And uh, I want to also start with a, uh, one more bit of engagement. Could somebody please give me a one-sentence definition of public art? <laughs> one-sentence definition of public art. Yes? By the people, for the people, of the people. Okay, by the people, for the people, of the people, or something like that. All right, give me another. Let's give another. We've got one. Public art, what is it? Yes, in the back. Art on public property, or funded with public funds, or selected with a civic kind of curation process. Great, good. Yes? Art that is accessible to everyone at all times. Accessible to everyone at all times. Mm -hmm. um, art that's meant to inspire engagement or um, connection of some kind. Maybe it's place or some message within the art. Got it. Engagement or connection of some kind, some message within the art. A wake-up call to the life within the community. A wake-up call to the life within the community. Good. Let's get a couple more, and then I'll tell you, I'll read you the definition that we came up with, and then we'll get going. A couple more. Public art. What is public art? Come on. You're not getting off the hook that easy. Public art makes a community. Public art makes a community. Fantastic outcome. We're going to be talking about that. One more. I'm not going to let you out. Come on. One more. Yes. A reflection of the community that helps connect us and remind us that we are connected. A reflection of the community that helps remind us that we are connected. I love that. All right. Here we go. After hours upon hours of wordsmithing and <laughs> wrestling and black eyes, the Montpelier Public Art uh, Master Plan has defined public art means a work of art that is visible and accessible to the public for a minimum of 40 hours per week. Public art may include sculpture, painting, installations, photography, video, works of light or sound, or any other work or project determined by the Public Art Commission <laughs> to satisfy the intent of this chapter, provided, however, that none of the following shall, shall be considered public art for the purposes of satisfying the requirements of this chapter, and then it seems things like uh, reproductions or decorative art or landscape, etc. Is that so, one sentence? 
Uh, no, that is not. That's a paragraph. That's a paragraph. All right. So uh, when I was thinking about how best to share with you our process, I, I thought it would be great for Dan to just start out and, and let you know one of the success, the key successes to this project was that we were not starting from scratch around the momentum in the community to do stuff. And Montpelier has got great momentum right now. So Dan's going to talk about some of the things that were already happening that we rolled the coattails up. Yeah, so um, I just entered into the public art process near the completion of this work, because um, I started only about a year ago. Um, so this is why I invited Paul to really give us talk. But, um, it built on a lot of planning that had taken place in Montpelier and not necessarily arts-related planning, and I think that's important to recognize. Uh, we got an EPA grant for, called Greening America's Capital Grant um, and did a lot of work looking at bike lanes and streetscape. Uh, we had um, just all sorts of comprehensive plans, uh, downtown master plans, things like that. Um, and they sort of touched on the art, but what this did was really build on it. But it was important that we had that foundation in place when we were looking to get uh, grants to, to fund this uh, plan. Um, Montpelier Light has a very active design committee. Uh, if you're familiar with the Main Streets model, uh, we kind of are based on that. So we do public art and beautification and things like that. So we have been doing smaller projects, uh, and we continue to do smaller projects um, to just enliven the streetscape, beautify downtown. But they're not usually permanent. They're not like huge commissioned works. This is like somewhere between guerrilla art and what a public art commission would do. Um, wayfinding master plan. We've been working on it for a few years. The banners on the light poles are the first piece um, that's in place, but by the end of this year, we're going to have uh, wayfinding in place. We just got a grant from the state to implement a comprehensive wayfinding program, so we'll have vehicular pedestrian uh, kiosks, all that jazz uh, for wayfinding. And it's all about creating a sense of place. Um, and then there's cool stuff going on in the transit center and the bike path extension, uh, a new distillery, which unfortunately is not quite open yet. I was really hoping it would be open for all of you to go get a drink after this. Um, but there's just a lot of energy going on downtown. The French Block, which is new housing that's um, been built in a building that was vacant for 80 years, the second and third floor. Uh, nothing was in it, and now there's affordable housing in it. So a lot of energy. And this is really building on that energy. And one more thing is uh, Ward Joyce, who's a local architect, um, founded this sort of uh, informal organization he calls Langdon Street Alive, which focuses on Langdon Street, which I mentioned. In, my intro, uh, which has done a lot of public artwork and events on Langdon Street, and I think that really helped to build the um, energy around this. Cool. Okay, so what we're talking about is how do we get started? What's the foundation we needed? And in, this is a page out of the master plan, that just how we got going, writing on all these coattails, and, and really there was a huge financial bump here too. Uh, the Taylor Street Transit Center was the largest uh, construct, public construction project in 30 years in Montpelier. And the mayor at the time, uh, as we were trying to get the NEA to give us some money through their Our Town uh, project, uh, grant project, uh, we were talking to the mayor and he said, well, we really want to have public art at the new transit center. And I said, okay, well, why don't we leverage uh, a piece of public art at the transit center into an Our Town grant to get an additional 50000 from NEA and we'll do this project. So first year we applied, it was all about this new installation at the Transit Center, and oh yeah, we were gonna do a, a planning process around it and create a public art master plan. Thumbs down from an <laughs> NEA on that. Uh, the yet next year, almost exactly the same proposal flipped with the planning process as the centerpiece. Oh yeah, we're gonna celebrate with the $50,000 commission that we'll put in at the Transit Center and they, they went with it. So we had 50,000 in our pocket from the city council, uh, easiest fundraising I've ever done. They had a $12 million project. The mayor wanted it to happen. He said, well, I think we can find 50,000 in that project budget for public art. So uh, when we applied to NEA, that was the, the funding foundation for the project. And then we pledged to raise 50,000 in addition to that. So how we, we structured a couple uh, I'm, I'm really into, I'm a little bit of a nerd about this, stuff, but uh, when we started going, we wanted to be really intentional on how the project was going to flow. And I think uh, this was also one of the things the NEA uh, was particularly uh, pleased with was the structure that we had. 
we knew that we were going to be inviting the city council to approve this because this is not something that lives at the arts council this is not something that should live in a, a friends up group this is public policy how is the city going to intentionally support and advance public art as a core piece of its identity and messaging to the world so we knew we had to sell it to the city council so there at the top uh, then we had a small leadership team, and uh, Dan and myself and Kevin Casey from the city were on that team, so executive committee. And I see Zahn here in the audience. He was one of the inspirations for being sure that you know these people well, you can work with them, you know you're going to be in the thick of it, pick your leadership team so that you can share a beer with them at any, at, on any given night and still be friends uh, through this process. And then uh, we spread out quickly into an advisory team, and this was the community. This was how we're, how we're gonna bring all sectors of the community together, and it included professional art people, it included artists, it included uh, the program director of the library, uh, business people. Um, you know, we tried to get as absolutely diverse uh, selection in that team as possible, and 17 came together at the beginning of the project. Two years later, we had about seven active. So uh, we can talk about that uh, in the Q&A section. But, uh, and then we were gonna hire a consultant. And so uh, we knew that we didn't have the skills to write the city policy. And there are about mm, a dozen consultants in the country that do public art master planning policy writing. And so it's a small tight group, but uh, Michelle Bailey at the Arts Council helped connect our RFQ to the listserv from Americans for the Arts. And next thing you knew, we were getting the uh, RFQs coming in, and we selected a group called Designing Local out of Ohio. So, getting going. Once we got all this in place, we wanted to be sure that we were engaging the community. And you know that question that we started with, what is public art? That was the question of the moment for almost the entire process. How are we going to define what public art is, and how is it going to live in our city and why should city council allocate funds out of the general fund every year to the art commission for them to invest in public art? So we had to have a really clear understanding of what that was. And so we did that in a series of different ways. And we had a, a, a well, let me go back one actually. So this bottom line, the community engagement, we had lunch talks, we had teaching artist workshops and school residencies, we had guest speakers, and I'm looking at Sarah Katz from BCA. I saw her earlier, she was one of our guest speakers. Um, and we had one-on-one -on -one interviews. Our consultant interviewed about 40 people in the community about art and how they felt about the community. And we uh, did a survey that got about 300 responders uh, that went out in social media, that kind of thing. And we wanted to know from people what they, what they believed about public art why they thought it was important to Montpelier, and would they be willing to support it? And so uh, those are some pretty interesting conversations. One of the things that was really fun about the lunch talks is that we um, did them at different times of the day in different locations and we got completely different demographics. We did one at the library and it was mostly uh, women of the age of about 60 plus. We did one at a lunchtime uh, where we offered a taco bar and it was business leaders because it was downtown during lunch. We did one at a record shop and it was mostly millennials. And you should have heard them. We need more stuff, we want more public. And they were just like, we need more activity in Montpelier and we need the doors, the places to keep their doors open after nine o'clock. Um, so a lot of venting about uh, public art from that group. We also, uh, created a series of workshops. This is one of them. We picked about five locations around Montpelier that were prime locations for public art. And we brought together some architects and artists, and we had them at stations, and the community was invited to go around and actually conceptualize what might live in those locations. And so this is our butt ugly center city garage. You'll see the picture on the left that's screaming out for something. Put heart on me, put on me. I hear that every time I walk by that. Damn, take note of that. And, and, and this is um, uh, the idea, well, let's, have, let's commission some high school kids to do something you know, wonderful on the side of that. And uh, this, this uh, garage lives on State Street as you are walking up the hill. And if you do, look to your left and you'll go, oh, it needs something. 
So we had uh, that along with, um, like for instance, earthworks in public in Hubbard Park, how we might do uh, temporary installations. Uh, we did one around uh, installations. Of, we had a school residency where a teaching artist spent uh, seven days at the middle school and the kids did visioning around what the future of Montpelier could be if they were infused with public art. And you can kind of see on the pinwheels, these were, these were all wind engaged. Uh, they wrote their poems or their visions for Montpelier and put them on those pinwheels. And these were all, on, this is all uh, basically a plastic product. So it held up for a little over two weeks, right at Christmas time. And it was right at, this is the front of City Hall. And so we installed it right there and uh, got the kids involved. And of course, that was a good talking point for the community. Uh, we also at that same installation had a, had everybody writing down uh, how public art makes them feel. So just a kind of a constant engagement with different sectors of the community to see, uh, to get ideas around what this could be. The lunch talks were really about defining public art and what is it, what are the different types of public art? Because you know, I think many people think public art is a statue, right? I mean, you know, wow, I, I know public art, it's that bronze thing in the middle of the circle, right? So we wanted to offer a bunch of different examples of what public art could be, public art that you can live on, that you can walk all around, and public art that actually transforms uh, the public library in Kansas City, for instance. This is the front of the public library. Uh, so uh, we, we had to kind of um, take a deep dive into what public art could be in order to get the community thinking expansively about how we could use art to define Montpelier and to give our expression to the world so that when people come here, they understand the energy and ethos of Montpelier as being a creative place to live. And you'd be, it was really interesting how many people that were interviewed identify Montpelier as a creative place, and then we'd say, can you name a piece of public art? Well, oh, there's that thing on the state house lawn. Oh, that's owned by the state, that's not really Montpelier, you know. And so we had very, very little public art here. By the way, bravo to uh, the Montpelier Live uh, Design Committee for the beautiful piece of public art that's on the parking lot. Uh, have you seen it yet? Uh, the, the, the garage parking lot downtown. You As you're walking back to the Capitol Plaza, look on your left after you walk by Julio's Mexican restaurant. There's a huge painting, um, a beautiful geometric painting that just went up last week, right? Saturday night, overnight. <laughs> Saturday night, overnight. <laughs> Moments before the rain came, plus the fair, somewhat uh, uh, blended uh, coloring, but uh, very cool. So uh, all different types of, of public art. Okay. Uh, as we got through the plan and started getting into the nitty gritty, we really wanted to be sure we had something that wasn't going to live on the shelf. So this is a uh, basically an excerpt from the plan, and I'm happy to, to send this to anybody. Well, and you can get it on the, uh, we're going to put it on the Montpelier Alive. Yeah, so there's a link on your thing. Um, it's not, unfortunately, I don't know why, on this link right now, but it will be by the time you go look at it, as long as you wait until Monday to go look at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so go there, and you can download this. It's, so it's about a, I don't know how many pages, 80 page plan. But about half of this is public policy and uh, guidelines. The front half of it is what we did, what we discovered about Montpelier, and so this is why you need a consultant. Unless you have someone in your community who can write public policy around public art. Uh, so as, as we get into the kind of the meat of what we asked the city council to adopt, these were the sections that uh, drove the plan. So the, we've we'll talked a little bit about the creating the foundation, the essence of Montpelier, uh, we talked about place-based strategies, things that the Public Art Commission could do, and also a priority action plan. Because what we wanted was, uh, and we kind of went through several iterations of what the Public Art Commission would look like, where it would live. There was a lot of discussion of what, what that month, and maybe it would live a month later alive. Uh, but in the end, we decided it would be a city commission that would be staffed by a city member, so it was a an official, you know, part of the city uh, government, and then they adopted these policies. So, this these policies really give you. I think of them as a filter, and they give the public art commission and the city 
a way to look through the lens of public art when they're investing in public infrastructure. <coughs> what we were saying to the city was, if you invest in public art, Montpelier will benefit, there'll be more vibrancy, there'll be more traffic, there'll be, our identity will be defined more clearly, and therefore you should be investing in the infrastructure of public art. So how are we gonna do that? Well, we have to have a deaccession plan, for instance. If we put up public art and have to take it down, how do we do that? That's in the plan. We have to have the guidelines for the, how the public arts commission works. How many are there on there? Just like we have in our, our boards, right? <coughs> existing for our bylaws. So all of that detail is in here, so nobody has to wonder, hmm, if we want to commission a $75,000 piece, who makes the decision on that final commission? Or how do we pull together a selection committee? How does that selection committee work? Is it separate than the Arts Commission? Yes, and blah, blah, blah. So a lot of details in there. I'm at my, my two, is that my two minute share? Yeah, you're at 20. I missed my, two, I missed my yeah. 10 minute share. Oh, we're right at 20, we're yeah. Okay, we are so <laughs> done. <laughs> Where's my, Um, okay, so we have, we're going to flip to questions. And, oh boy, I, yes, I am. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think my, 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 my point, my uh, moments. Uh, uh, truth in advertising, I'm a city councilor, and I think the last people who should be selecting public art are city councilors. In fact, after one round of that, we make sure we put it away. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Bravo. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 how did you get buy-in on that, and, and, and how do you reach a, uh, uh, a point of political? How do you get into the political comfort zone of the Well, so the city council, the the city council approved the plan, which created the commission. But the commission is actually made up of um, representative from Montpelier Live, a representative from the Economic Development Corporation, a representative from Vermont College of Fine Arts, um, and four at-large members that were appointed by city council. So the city council don't serve on the uh, committee. They were really excited about the plan. Um, I think actually one of the things is uh, some of the other commissions that you'd more likely end up dealing with if you wanted to do something like this in the past, like Design Review Commission and Historic Preservation Commission, uh, maybe were a little bit more hesitant to get excited about things like that. Um, so I think the council was excited about creating this new body that might really actively engage in this and get some stuff going um, that might run into roadblocks before. Yeah. I have a two-part question. In Burlington, we have public art that emerged from what has been, upon reflection, looked at as a, as a result of systemic racism. And we also have permanent public art that it, it is frustrating in that it gives the appearance of uh, uh, favoring or aggrandizing a particular artist at the expense of infrastructure that was removed to put it there that would have served many artists, public oh, important voice. So as you talk about what your message is through art, uh, I, I wonder how sensitive you are to these interpretations of it. I, I like how Dan was quick to hand the microphone back to you. <laughs> hey, thanks, Dan. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yes, that's an absolute uh, upfront question that is the challenge for the Public Art Commission to be dealing with. And so one of the, the only answer I have to that is, uh, be, you know, have people on the Public Art Commission uh, aware of that question and that, that challenge. And that's something they're gonna have to deal with as they, they go through it. I mean, uh, there's, I don't know if I have a, uh, an easier answer except to say, uh, the people who are making those decisions will, should be aware of that and grappling with that. Because that, that's real, very real and upfront issues. Yeah. Uh, question regarding how you implement the process and keep it going. Do you do an RFP or an RFQ? And in the state of Massachusetts, we have what's called a procurement law. So it hinders us from being able to work directly with artists. We're working on legislation to change that. But our Chapter 30B defines an artist the same way that they define somebody who's bidding on cement. Mm -hmm. So is your question is, 
what's your process for procurement? And are you able to do an RFP or an RFQ and okay. work with your artists? Got it. So yes, because we did commission a, a piece in the process, and we put out an RFP, uh, uh, request for proposals to artists around the state, and we had a very, what I thought was very a, a nice process engaged by, uh, again, with Michelle Bailey and uh, David, uh, Michelle Bailey from the Vermont Arts Council, and David Sheets, the curator of the state. Uh, and so there's also a selection committee, separate from both the steering committee, the Arts Council, and what now has become the Arts Commission. So we established a community selection committee, and there was a whole process around that. Um, I'm not sure how that relates to what's happening in Massachusetts, but uh, there's also a detailed explanation in the plan on what that process is. In the back? Um, so uh, following up on that, and um, FYI, I'm a former counselor, and I co-signed what was said by that we should council members should not be selecting um, policy or at least art. And I commend you for making this part of the city structure because it goes beyond the individual and it's policy that will just last. And the question is, and I got here a little late, did the policy proposed policies include a percent for the arts or is there currently uh, a percent for the art legislation within the municipality? No, there isn't, and that was a big question around how we were going to fund the commission. And so we had a lot of discussions around that because uh, Montpelier Live was already has a design committee that's uh, committing a certain amount of money each year to public art, but we wanted a lot more money than that. Uh, so we looked at the 1%. The challenge for Montpelier was we don't have enough uh, capital projects. And so if you're in a little tiny community, I mean, it works great if you're in Boston and you've got hundreds of millions going into public uh, infrastructure every year. Uh, so we couldn't rely on a 1%, but it is in the plan to look at a 1% in the first one or two years of the commission to see how that could be implemented because, you know, in the case of, for instance, the, the uh, uh, transit center, had we had that, we would have had a $120,000 chunk uh, for public art. So absolutely, I think Montpelier is going to look at that, um, but not yet. Do you want to talk about how it is funded? Or I can talk about yeah, sure. <laughs> So we um, approached the city council and asked instead for a $50,000 a year flat uh, amount um, to support the commission that, that thought would be, we would raise additional funds, use that as matching dollars. Um, they committed this first year to $25,000. Um, and then uh, Montpelier Live controls the downtown improvement district. Uh, so we have a small amount of funds and we've committed an additional $5,000 a year. So the commission has $30,000 in, in the first year. Yes, and the blue. If you systematize this identity as a creative community, who's responsible now for letting people know that you have this public art so that they will come and see it? Who's your marketing quality? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Are you full time, or is this about? Is this a labor of love? Is this no? I'm, I'm full time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So I think like, you know, New England wide, we tend to be, um, you know, fairly progressive on a lot of things, but we're very conservative about the built environment. And I think that, you know, especially, you know, in, in a region that's full of, you know, historic assets, I've seen in a lot of places where I've worked, like historic preservation sort of being the third rail conversation in terms of putting forward public art that's kind of progressive and relevant and, Kind of forward thinking and not just kind of harkening back to historic time. And I'm wondering that, you know, in, in a city full of, you know, beautiful historic buildings, was that something you explicitly addressed um, in the process about how it relates to, to historic infrastructure and how that, you know, in a, in a, how that conversation works in a way that's not hindering looking at sort of forward thinking art? So I'm going to answer in two parts. First part is that the NEA required a pretty intensive review before they would fund the grant, knowing that we were going to be putting, uh, installing a piece in a historic district. So we had some hoops to jump through there, but it, it wasn't at all about the aesthetic. The review was just uh, had to do with some other issues around historic preservation. The other side of that answer is that we struggled when we commissioned the work. We got some very, what I would say, unusual, uh, progressive, avant-garde uh, proposals and some very traditional ones. And the one that was selected uh, is pretty non-traditional. 
and the, the committee that of uh, community members that came together specifically wanted something that was non-traditional so that we wouldn't be stuck in that oh this you know this is a granite sculpture um, and uh, so my segue is right here uh, uh, uh. I also don't, I don't mean to dismiss historic preservation because Montpelier has the largest National Register of Historic Places district in Vermont and obviously our downtown is full of historic buildings um, and I think that uh, one thing that Vermonters in general are really inspired by is how contemporary art can integrate with historic buildings. So um, if you look at the Kent Gallery in Callis, which is a town about 15 minutes from here, they've taken this um, old farmhouse and turned it into a contemporary art space. The Garage Cultural Center, which just opened downtown, um, which is hosting some events tonight, um, is hosting has hosted some really contemporary um, art installations. Uh, so, yeah, this is the piece that was selected for the Transit Center. Um, you want to talk about it? Briefly? Sure, it's called Counter Rotation. It's a six foot wide marble bench, and every time it's rotated around, it activates a split flat machine, which actually you can't see in the picture, but it'll be on that back wall. Split flat machine is what you see in old train stations where the little flips go, you know, track five, and they, and they yeah. give you the time. And it makes a really cool sound, but you can program them. And so we're gonna be programming it with things like poetry, and there are also images, and you can, uh, can you give me my next slide? So it can do images as well. Uh, like this historic uh, Amanaki uh, canoeing image. And so there'll be an audible uh, response that'll attract people to it, and also the fun of kind of turning this huge two-ton chunk of granite that's in this really sophisticated, you know, thing to keep it from going too fast. And then, like, the middle school will be able to say, okay, this is your, your month to program in some poetry, and then the kids hopefully will come down and say, yeah, uh, it was my ball. So, yeah, a fun piece. Yes. The name of the artist. Ah, Nava Gomez and oh no, Greg Greg Gomez and Nava Rodrigo uh, from Putney. Yeah. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about how you're going to show the impact of the investment? We just got a I'm in the city of Boston. We just got a percent for our program a couple years ago. You think once there's those kind of public dollars flowing into public art, there's a lot of like how do you tell the story yeah. of that impact? Right, exactly. And so uh, I'm going to, uh, I will answer, but before I forget, on your resource sheet, uh, on the very, the very first resource is a link to the NEA that has actually the, you can look at the application that we wrote for the arts, for our, the Our Town project. And there's a section in there that asks this exact question, how you're going to measure the impact of your work. And so in creative placemaking, we measure that quantifiably by vibrancy. And how is it going to change the patterns of the people who are coming to our community? And how is it going to change the pattern of our community to come together in different ways? And so there are all kinds of ways you can measure that. And then there's the, the harder part is the qualitative and, you know, definition of impact. How is this defining Montpelier differently? How are we going to use it in publicity to push out our identity to the world? And there, um, you know, that's looser. But generally, the big impact is uh, traffic, vibrancy. How's it going to bring people together, and how's it going to be a force for uh, creating that energy in downtown that we don't have right now? Yes? It, it sounds like you used the design committee of the, the Main Street structure um, to kind of put an entree into this process, um, which seems like it might be more palatable for individuals that you know might be um, a little nervous about public the public art process. Can you talk a little bit about um, uh, how your wayfinding plan may be integrated with the public art plan and your other plans and how that was funded? Um, and so I, <laughs> let, me, let me see if I can parse the, a couple of questions in there. One is, is there one about getting people, uh, changing hearts and minds, and yes. moving towards the momentum of a public art plan? Correct. Yes, and so then the other. that part I can answer. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I think absolutely, um, you know, we're often 
not often, but we do small scale works. Um, the design committee of Montpelier Lab. Uh, the flag installation over the river that you can see from the Langman Street Bridge, or you'll see it on uh, State Street as you walk by. Um, this mural that we just did, um, things like banners, and, and this is a you know an iteration of we had banners before, um, just decorations and things like that. Um, so that I think raises awareness about art in, in town and, and we're doing small scale things. I mean this mural project is going to be maybe $600 uh, and definitely the hardest part was getting it approved. Actually doing it took us four hours, you know, um, two years in the making. Um, and, uh, and you know what Ward has done on Langdon Street. Um, I think it raises awareness, and, and I do think it made it easier to engage in these conversations because people had some idea of um, what public art was a little bit when we started having it. Is that fair to say? Yeah. And one of the, the things we needed to flip to was the notion of what's the difference between downtown beautification and public art? Yeah. You know. And so Montpelier Live is now taking more of that downtown beautification. Well, they're already doing that, but they're kind of pulling out the public art component out of mostly what they do and giving it to the public art commission. Um, the other uh, short answer that I would add to that is that the process that we went through of the engagement, this is not about transferring information. It's about getting people doing things that change the way they think, right? And this, in this instance, we're asking them to change the way they think about their concept of public art. So the engagement was all around uh, learning through doing, not just telling people things. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm curious how the performing arts play into initial conversations and we're working with the dancer on the Right. Wow. So, how much time do I have left? Um, she's asking about performing art as public art. We had a really intense conversation over a series of months. Alana uh, Finney was on the advisory team uh, specifically because she was coming from a background of doing publicly engaged dance and site-based work. And well, why can't this public art commission support performing arts? Well, and then suddenly, well, are we going to support theater in the in the park? Or are we going to support street art? Or are we, you know, and, and what are all the different ways that? So we had to come together with a definition around. Uh, a definition that the city council could believe in investing in around public art as infrastructure for defining and, and increasing Montpelier's vitality. And they decided in the end that ephemeral performance art did not fit into that of what the city council would be investing in. Yeah. I'm always curious in situations like this how much infrastructure might play a role, as in like short stages of flat top rocks for impromptu performance art, but the investment is in the structure itself. Right. And so one of the projects that's recommended in the plan uh, is a, uh, well, no, actually it was not, it didn't make it into the final plan, but one of the things that we played around with was. Uh, a, a portable stage, in essence, that could act, be activated to do the kind of things that Hannah's talking about, where we'd have a, a pop-up performance things or opportunities for pop-up art, and it's not one of the things recommended in the plan for short-term or mid-term goals, but it's definitely in the mix. So, you know, each community is going to come together with this definition around this. Uh, we just had to be, because this was first time out of the gate for the city council to be investing, we wanted to be sure they knew that they were going to be getting a thing. And I literally, the quote from the mayor is, I can't go to the public and ask them to, to just give you $50,000 without knowing what that's gonna be. No way, no way was she gonna do that. And so, and if Anne was here, she wouldn't mind me saying that. Um, yes, and. Yes, um, and. We also, in the plan, um, made sure that at um, the openings of any public art, like when we celebrate when this, the completion of this, that performing arts could be a part of that, and that it could be funded as part of that. And we recommended um, that we look towards the creation of a cultural plan um, to engage further in um, how we can support this work. So I was excited to just have been at the Portland main cultural plan presentation, learning about that, um, because I think that's the next step. But we really had to draw some boundaries 
in order to make it possible. And I think that's important. Like, you can't do everything all at once. Like, we had so much time and so much money and we needed to get support for this project. Like, we had to stop somewhere. <coughs> and I think what, um, about the distinction between public art master plan and a cultural plan, that was a really exciting conversation for Montpelier to go through because we don't have a cultural plan. But in the short-term goals of the public art plan, it it's, uh, suggests funding a cultural plan through the public art commission, which of course is much more comprehensive and far-reaching than just a public art plan. Someone over, someone over here. I have a question. Um, how do you, I find that in our community, we do a lot of volunteer public additions to community events and um, functions um, and there's a perception made that we love to do art we're just going to do art and it's kind of a mixed message to the people that don't do art that we should get paid to do the art that is been given to these community events and it's kind of a volunteer thing of perception now that art is a way to make things beautified kind of a gray zone um, where the events are decorated by the artists in the community but they're not paid to do the decoration part of it so how do you, with your officials of getting public art done, like we have art walls in Swanton, is where I'm from, and it's all volunteer base, it's all donated paint, it's all kind of that presence, and it's an open canvas that can change at any point, but how do you get those people to know that artists need to get paid as well to produce the creativity? Yeah, that's a really good point, and we had a lot of discussion around that. Uh, and so in the plan, it defines those parameters around that, and the di distinction around professional uh, and you know where those lines are. And by the way, your colleagues from the uh, Arts Council were here yesterday. Yes, I know, I saw a picture. Yes, and so well, it's one who's well represented. So yeah, that's a real issue, you know. Because um, you don't want to give them the wrong idea that, well, we'd love to do it, but we are professional. We do have a talent that should be paid for. So right, it's exactly. Really a, a mixed signal that you can start to give people if you just keep volunteering. Right. Yeah, exactly. So. Yes. Is that the two minute? No, that, oh, that's we're at it. 20 minutes, but you could maybe take one more question. Okay. And then Marvin's going to actually yeah. respond to your question, which is as, so I'm part of the city of Burlington, we have a public art review process moving towards the 1% in the next year. But what we as a city make sure is that we never hire an artist unless they're paid. So it's just from a policy perspective, so that we never set in motion anything that is an example. I mean, it's kind of, if we don't set that example, no one else is going to follow it. So. Okay. <laughs> okay, thanks everybody. Uh, questions, feel free to mingle and thanks for being here.